And I would actually even go a step further than Zurich. German unification and its security implications, I mean, that was certainly a trigger for France's insistence on monetary union. But for France, monetary union had always been a desirable thing in any case, because the French were just sick and tired of having to devalue their currency against the much harder German mark again and again. There have always been structural differences in Europe. Before the euro, such differences in competitiveness were reflected in long-term adjustments in exchange rates. So consider this. In the 35 years before the introduction of the euro, that is between 1963 and 1998, all major European currencies progressively lost value against the Deutsche Mark. In 1963, you had to pay 81 marks and 36 pfennigs for 100 French francs. But on the eve of the euro's introduction, that was only 29 marks and 82 pfennigs, so a devaluation of the French franc against the mark of 63.3% over 35 years. And for other currencies, it was even more extreme. Um, the Italian lira devalued 84% against the German mark between 63 and 98. And you could really go around Europe and see similar developments against the Greek drachma and the Portuguese escudo or the Spanish peseta. The massive devaluations of other currencies against the German mark indicate the very tight monetary policy of the old German Bundesbank, the country's central bank, but it also reveals and reflects the high competitiveness and the productivity of the German economy compared to the rest of Europe. So European economies like Italy, Spain and France had to continually devalue their currencies to remain competitive with Germany. <coughs> and that was clearly humiliating to the French, the Spanish and the Italians. And for that reason alone, they had been trying to push Germany into monetary union. And German unification finally made that possible. Now Mitterrand could actually blackmail the Germans into giving up the mark, because otherwise he would have blocked unification. The great historical irony of all of this is, of course, that if the French had really planned to weaken the powers of newly reunited Germany through monetary union, this attempt has now completely backfired. Germany's influence has never been greater than today. Berlin can now effectively dictate fiscal policy <coughs> to Athens, to Lisbon, and to Rome. They can even exchange governments in these countries. And perhaps in the future they can dictate policy to Paris too. And this is most definitely not what Mitterrand had planned. Perhaps an even greater irony, however, is that the Germans are not at all happy with their new hegemonic power within Europe. <laughs> As opinion polls in Germany show, they have not the slightest interest in ruling the European periphery. Large majorities in Germany still reject the euro and neither want to pay or rule. In fact, the Germans would be content being just a greater version of Switzerland. Prosperous, a little bit boring, and vigorously unengaged in international affairs. <laughs> because that is the very role that the West Germans learned to play to perfection between 1945 and 1990. If the British and the French had known the post-war Germans a little bit better, they would have been intensely relaxed about a larger Germany. As it turns out, the euro really started as a French insurance policy against German power. But even as an insurance policy, it has failed. Against their will, it has turned the Germans into the new rulers of Europe, and it has consigned France to be the weaker partner in the Franco-German relationship. If Mitterrand had known all of this in advance, he would have insisted on Germany keeping the Deutsche Mark as the price for German unification. So after this history excursion, let's now turn to the economics of the current crisis. The euro has now been with us for, uh, the euro crisis, I should say, has now been with us for three years. It was in late 2009 when the then Greek Prime Minister Papandreou admitted that his country had a bit of a fiscal problem. <laughs> Many now see this as the beginning of the Euro crisis. I disagree with this view. To me, the Euro crisis started much earlier. It pretty much started with the day the Euro was introduced. First as an electronic currency in 1999 and then as coins and paper in 2002. And to see why the Euro was in crisis even back then, when many politicians still claim that all was well before the global financial crisis, you need to look behind the facade of monetary union. True, there were very few people before 2009 who actually spoke of a euro crisis. Yields on government debt in Europe were low, and the exchange rate of the euro was by and large stable. But beneath all of this, something was clearly wrong in Europe. The first problem was, what I already mentioned, the divergence in competitiveness. That just didn't disappear just because they introduced monetary union. 
The introduction of the euro at the time had kept a lid on wage increases across the German economy simply because Germany had entered monetary union with an exchange rate that was too high for the country. And this first led to high unemployment in Germany and uh, then also it triggered some dramatic economic reforms combined with the policy of wage restraint. But both the wage restraint and the economic reforms were painful for Germany. I was in Germany at the time. There were 5 million people unemployed in Germany and German growth was anemic. But it was a painful time that Germany went through in the early 2000s. But all of these reforms and the wage restraint policy ensured that Germany really became more and more productive and competitive over time. Meanwhile, the story on the periphery of Europe was completely different. The southern European economies at the time were having a party because they entered monetary union with the competitive advantage of low exchange rates. And they suddenly had to pay lower interest rates too. So while Germany was actually going through hell to become more competitive, the south of Europe celebrated La Dolce Vita. However, the southern country's chronic inability to reform meant that over time they simply slept further down the European competitiveness ladder. Their products became more expensive, their governments became more indebted, and the consequences were substantial deficits in the current account and high unemployment in countries with excessive wage increases. Countries like Spain, Greece, Portugal, and uh, Italy. But these competitiveness developments in the periphery were not the only thing that was wrong with the euro at the time. The euro's official interest rate really only reflected circumstances in struggling Germany at the time, but not the boom that was happening simultaneously in the periphery countries, not the boom that was happening in Spain or in Ireland. So this unrestrained boom, especially in the construction sector in both countries, in Spain and Ireland, was bound to end in a fiasco. And in the end, this had a devastating effect on the fiscal situation and the financial system of both countries. And finally, the euro also failed to impose fiscal <laughs> discipline on its member countries, and nobody ever played by the rules that were supposed to govern monetary union. And the political independence of the European Central Bank was also damaged right from the start. Its first president, it was Dutchman Wim Doysenberg, had been elected for a full eight-year term that was meant to guarantee the ECB's political independence. However, political pressure ensured that Doysenberg resigned his position after four years to allow his colleague Jean-Claude Trichet to take over just as the French government had previously demanded. So if you take these three issues together, the diverging competitiveness that couldn't be balanced anymore by currency devaluations, the property bubbles in the periphery, and the severe issues with the governance of the euro, you can see that the euro did not even work well before the GFC. The problems of monetary union, therefore, did not start with the GFC. They only became visible with the GFC. And for the past five years, the Europeans have been trying to keep monetary union alive, despite all the built-in problems. So one of the measures to gloss over the problems of monetary union is that little-known system called Target 2 that none of you have heard of before. And the, actual, the acronym actually stands for the Trans-European Automated Real-Time Growth Settlement Express Transfer System, <laughs> or TARGET, although I would rather call it Europe's hidden doomsday machine. <laughs> TARGET 2 is meant to facilitate bank transfers across all EU member states, with the exception of Sweden and the UK. And in ordinary times, TARGET would have been a technical tool without any political implications. But times in Europe are, of course, not ordinary. And so over the past five years, Target has become a potential time bomb for Europe's financial system. Since the beginning of the financial crisis, interbank lending from core to periphery countries has all but dried up. And at the same time, periphery countries have experienced massive capital flight out of their countries. On top of all of that, there are trade deficits in European periphery countries, <coughs> which need to be financed by capital imports. All three factors combined have triggered a European balance of payments crisis under the target system. Put simply, central banks in surplus countries, that is Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Finland, they have to fill the gap caused by the capital flight and the trade imbalances in the peripheries, so Greece, Spain, Portugal and the others, because private capital is no longer available to do just that. They are not, no longer financing the party in the periphery, so central banks step in with this targets to system. So in this way, the central banks from the healthier core of the Eurozone are now sitting on enormous claims against the rest of the Euro system. And the German Bundesbank is now the biggest lender in this system, and they have accumulated claims against the rest of Europe of more than 695 
billion euros. That's around about a trillion New Zealand dollars. And this sum is almost four times the guarantees given by the German government to the European Rescue Fund, the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, for which the German parliament, after a long discussion, has only provided the comparatively modest sum of 190 billion euros. So, as I said, the only other major creditors within the euro system are Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Finland, whereas all other eurozone countries actually owe to the system their debtors within target. And there are serious implications of the target to imbalances, perhaps not in the short term, because the system is still technically working, but long term, there are enormous problems resulting from that. Because in the case of any default of any debtor nation, uh, their target balances would have to be written off by the other Eurozone countries, and the other Eurozone countries have to take a hit according to their share in the European Central Bank's subscribed capital. So in plain language, if, say, Greece defaulted, Germany's Bundesbank would lose about 40 billion euros overnight. And ultimately, the German taxpayers would then have to recapitalize their central bank. But unfortunately, this is not even the worst case scenario, because the German share of potential write-downs increases with every country departing from the Eurozone. If more countries left the Eurozone without being able, or maybe without even being willing to settle their, balance, uh, their, their target books, Germany would take even higher losses. And conversely, should the Germans one day decide that they wish to leave the euro behind to introduce their new Deutschmark, the chances are close to zero that other European countries would voluntarily settle their 695 billion euro bill with Germany. <coughs> it now looks as if for the past five years of the financial crisis, Germany has effectively kept the trade imbal imbalances party going in the euro periphery countries. But when the party is over, Germany will be sitting on enormous claims against these other countries, which will be effectively worthless. We can actually simplify the whole story. Germany has been exporting like mad and crazy. The others have paid for it by freshly printed central bank money. That money was shifted into Germany as a claim, but um, eventually the whole system will collapse, and then the Germans will actually find out that all the nice um, exports they had over the past five years were effectively not paid for. So what was once meant as a technical tool to facilitate bank transfers within Europe has now really become this kind of doomsday machine. And for Europe, there is no easy way out of this balance of payments crisis. But what Europe is still discussing and what Germany is vehemently resisting, the transformation of um, the European Union into a fiscal liability union, has long been achieved by the backdoor of the target system. So forget about the official rescue packages, forget about the European Financial Stability Facility and the European Stability Mechanism. They are trifles in comparison with the target to a mechanism. If we're then finally looking at the fiscal responses to the crises, crisis, one thing should have become quite clear over the past few years. Whatever European politicians have been able to cobble together, it has never been enough to calm the crisis for longer than a few weeks. And the reason is quite simple. The sums required to end the crisis are so gigantic that no European country, not even the stronger ones like Germany, can actually afford them. In fact, these sums are too large to, for European countries even just to borrow them. Frankly, I don't think there is a positive solution in sight. The crisis has been festering for way too long, so whatever happens next, it will be ugly, it will be painful, and it may be chaotic and it may be violent. So perhaps the most likely scenario in Europe um, is for the ECB, the European Central Bank, to just try to inflate the problems away. And with his latest announcements, um, Mario Draghi, the ECB president, has indicated that the ECB is planning to do just that. By signaling the possibility of strong ECB interventions in bond markets, the ECB president did not only calm the markets temporarily, he really revealed where the EU is heading. In a way, it is an utterly absurd situation. Bailing out other countries and other countries' banks, pooling Europe's sovereign debt or issuing euro bonds may be incompatible with the German constitution. They may well violate EU treaty law. They lack any meaningful democratic legitimacy, and they are certainly unpopular in those countries most likely to foot the bill. So in summary, these measures should be impossible to implement. But disguised as monetary policy, these quintessentially fiscal arrangements do not only become possible, they almost look legal. Simply claim that the monetary transmission mechanism is broken and apparently there is a justification to save the whole of Europe from bankruptcy. That's as easy as it is. Even better, 
While the fiscal measures in Europe are necessarily limited to, limited to the funds countries can raise in taxes or through running deficits, monetary interventions in a fiat money world have no such limitations. They can run for as long as tree trunks can be turned into banknotes or zeros added to electronic accounts. But perhaps the biggest advantage in Europe's current malaise is something else. Not a single national parliament needs to be consulted before the ECB finally opens the floodgates. No European governments need to be involved in the process, and even if parliaments or governments oppose the measures, they would not have any realistic chance of stopping them. To avoid a series of sovereign defaults, this only leaves the ECB then as the final backstop. But the costs will be massive. Let's be clear. The trillions of euros of debt, both in the public and in the private sector, are too large to ever be repaid. Even in a scenario with moderate economic growth, this would be extremely difficult, but in today's Europe of economic stagnation and facing the rapid aging of its societies, this becomes an impossible task. In any other circumstance, when borrowed funds cannot be repaid, it's a default, bankruptcy. Not so in Europe, thanks to the help of Draghi's ECP. By soaking up the bad debt with freshly created central bank money, Draghi will keep the illusion alive that Europe can actually meddle out of its current debt disaster. But he can only achieve this by devaluing the savings of hundreds of millions of savers and pensioners. If the ECB followed Draghi's need, that's assuming he was not just bluffing, a blown up money supply would meet a sluggish environment with collapsing demand in many European economies. Under these circumstances, it is not very plausible to generate big price hikes, hikes across the board, so the general price level will not perhaps rise by dramatic figures immediately. But we will see the continuation of minuscule interest rates available to ordinary savers, pension funds, and life insurances, and they will be unable to yield a positive real return and thus leave all of those invested in them a little bit poorer over time and all of their savings will be eventually eroded. It will just take a little bit longer than under hyperinflation. So Europeans should really be grateful to Signor Draghi as he has given them a glimpse into their future. It is a future in which the continent's economic fate may be determined not by parliaments, not by governments, not by treaties, not by courts, but by its central bank. It is a scenario in which every owner of money will be robbed a little each year to pay the debts of sovereigns and the financial sector. And so the domestic prospects for Europe look really grim. The Europeans are bound to monetize their problems over long periods of time, and the gigantic mountains of public debt will be dealt with by the printing press of the European Central Bank. Now, this is an irony, isn't it? because the euro was meant originally to make all of Europe a little bit more German. That's why the ECB was located in Frankfurt. And that's why the ECB statute was actually copied from the German Central Bank, the Bundesbank. What's happening now is the complete opposite. Instead of making Europe more German, the euro actually turns all of Europe into Italy. <laughs> and this is the future of Europe. It may not be the immediate Eurocalypse, or however you may call this, but it will be a long descent into monetary hell. <coughs> Europe's problems are painfully real, but you should not believe that they would inevitably lead to a cataclysmic crisis. It now looks as if it's going to be much worse. <laughs> there is never going to be a solution, just a slow, ongoing decline. There's not a purgatory from which there is at least an eventual escape route to heaven, but a Dantean inferno with its famous inscription above the gates. Lasciate ogni speranza voi cantate. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> How appropriate that the ECB is currently headed by an Italian. Thank you. <laughs>